Coming up on DTNS, Allison Sheridan shares her experience with Tesla's full self-driving beta. Microsoft finishes a bad week on a high note and what the tears of joy emoji says about all of us. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 3rd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And this is Allison Sheridan from the Podfeed Podcast. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about glow-in-the-dark dogs on uh, Good Day Internet. If you'd like that conversation uh, and all the other things we talk about, get patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, and John and Becky Johnston. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. DD Global plans to withdraw from the New York Stock Exchange. The company debuted on the exchange back in June, but Chinese regulators quickly delisted its apps and suspended user registration soon after. The company announced on its Weibo account it will start preparations for listing in Hong Kong. It just got here, Didi. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess they, they're in the transportation business. They move around. Storing data in DNA has been appealing because of its extremely high density and durability. Researchers at the University of Washington's Molecular Information Systems Laboratory, along with some folks from Microsoft, published a paper detailing the first nanoscale DNA storage writer, which could help bring usable write speeds to DNA storage. Uh, this is one of those, you know, 10 years down the road, it's going to be amazing. And this is a big step forward. The DNA storage writer in the paper could write data a thousand times more tightly than previous writers. And the next step is to embed digital logic in the chip to let individual control of millions of electrode spots happen to write kilobytes per second of data in DNA. So we still got a ways to go, but they're, they're making progress. According to documents seen by, by Bloomberg News, a draft EU proposal would presume that any worker whose job is controlled by a digital platform is an employee. Obviously, this has been a hot topic over the last couple of years. Platforms would have a legal obligation to prove otherwise. The rules are expected to be made public next week and would further require support from EU countries and the European Parliament before becoming law. Yeah, interesting way of approaching that law instead of just throwing all freelancers in the same bucket. Twitter's getting headlines for removing 2,160 accounts that were fighting against allegations of human right abuses in China, but those accounts had no followers and pretty much no effect. Getting less attention, but in the same announcement, were 268 accounts in Tanzania who would find content posted by human rights groups there, then copy it and publish it on an external website, but set the date to be before the original tweet. Then go to Twitter, submit a copyright violation complaint to get the human rights content taken down. Uh, quite a lot a of steps to That's a special kind of through. evil. It is, is really, it's... yeah. Uh, Twitter also removed accounts for misinformation in Mexico, Russia, Uganda, and Venezuela. Esports commenter Ludwig Aren made a splash in his community when he moved from Twitch to YouTube gaming on December 1st. December 1st. He made another splash when his live stream was suspended December 2nd. Ludwig <laughs> believes the takedown happened because he was reviewing the 50 most popular vintage videos on YouTube. Probably some, some copyright issues there. And the content ID seems to have triggered shortly after playing a few seconds of Baby Shark. I'm sorry in advance for even saying that out loud. Man, he expects yeah, to remove it. live streaming on Saturday. Re resume, Man. you mean, right? Oh, it, you know, they should take down Baby Shark. <laughs> she said, that's your solution. Don't take down Ludwig. <laughs> take down Baby Shark. All right, let's uh, talk a little more about uh, NVIDIA does not look like it's going to get armed. Uh, in September 2020, NVIDIA announced a deal to acquire uh, chip design maker ARM. That deal isn't done yet. And at this point, looks like it may not happen at all. Thursday, the United States Federal Trade Commission voted four to nothing across party lines. Let that sink in. To file suit in its administrative court to block NVIDIA's proposed acquisition of ARM. The suit alleges that the deal would give NVIDIA anti-competitive control of chip technology and designs needed for competing chips. The FTC believes that would then result in higher prices for consumers, reduced choice, and stifle innovation in new technologies for things like data centers and cars. 
even if the FTC's court finds in favor of NVIDIA, that, that decision isn't coming soon, and so the merger isn't happening soon. The administrative trial is scheduled for May 10th. Administrative law judges are independent decision makers who hear FTC complaints first, but they're within the FTC. Their decisions can only be appealed to the full FTC panel first, then they go on to the U.S. Circuit Court and enter the more traditional court system. So this could go on for a while. The Wall Street Journal points out that chip company mergers are not popular these days. The U.S. blocked Broadcom's acquisition of Qualcomm back in 2018. Same year, China nixed Qualcomm's own acquisition of NXP Semiconductor. NVIDIA is based in the U.S. ARM is based in England. It's owned by Japan's SoftBank, but it's based in England. And they are under investigation around the world. Uh, the UK launched an investigation of the deal in November on competition and national security grounds. We mentioned that on the show then. The EU began an investigation in October of whether the merger would restrict access to arms technology. And China is also reviewing the deal. So ARM does the architecture and the and the the design of the architecture. They don't actually make any chips. So w what do you picture the the concern is for Nvidia owning the architecture? Yeah, I think that's kind of fundamental to the concern, right? Uh, if people don't realize what what Allison's referring to is that when you talk about an ARM chip, it's never really an ARM chip. It's a Qualcomm chip, or it's an Apple chip, or it's a Samsung chip, but it's using ARM's technology. Might be its design, it might just be some of its uh, its architecture, uh, but it's made by somebody else. Uh, it's even likely to be partially designed by somebody else. Apple just kind of licensed the instruction set from ARM and then designs the chip itself. So that's what they're concerned about, Allison, is this is the design Switzerland of the chip world and mm -hmm. arm designs are on the ascendancy intel is kind of you know th there's a question about how much how much it can grow in the future so if nvidia were to control arm and nvidia also makes chips itself then there's a concern that well now it's no longer switzerland and playing equally with everybody it might prefer nvidia so anybody who makes chips wouldn't be allowed to buy it probably well i don't you know i mean who knows? <laughs> we, we we don't even know if Nvidia will be allowed. Maybe they will be. Maybe maybe they'll they'll win their court case. Uh, but that if you make chips, it sounds like you're going to have a harder time getting approval. Uh, the way all of this is going. I mean, my my initial question when the story broke uh, yesterday afternoon uh, after our show yesterday was sort of like I don't personally care if Nvidia buys Arm or not. I don't need that to be a win for NVIDIA. I don't work there. But, okay, if that is something that can't be done, is that a bigger win for consumers? You know, as a consumer, I want the best chip architecture I can get. Yeah, and, right. And, you know, I, and I'm, I, I, there are certain companies that I, that I buy from more than others, but there are other companies who are also benefiting from ARM architecture. So is this... I mean, who's besides Nvidia itself? Who is rooting for Nvidia? Nvidia here. Well, SoftBank is <laughs> for because well, they want sure. the money. Okay, yes, uh, everybody, sure. everybody but, on that side. No, that's a good point. Uh, Nvidia would argue that ARM will do better as a part of Nvidia because Nvidia can make sure to fund them properly. Nvidia is doing great as a company, and ARM can only get better with Nvidia's resources behind it. And Nvidia has said over and over, we promise to continue to offer ARM uh, licenses on the same level that they're offered now, if not better. Uh, they, they say they have no intention of shutting it off. Uh, and this is a change in the regulatory environment. In the past, it would have been, well, let's get that in writing, NVIDIA. Let's make sure you can't uh, shut people out from ARM, but then we'll let you have it. Now, it seems like the regulatory environment worldwide, not just in the United States, is, uh, you know what? If there's a hint that even though you say you won't, you could, we might not allow it. And mm -hmm. that could be bad for ARM if ARM can't survive on its own. If if ARM is not able, you know, to to make a go of it on its own, which you know, the fact that SoftBank wants to get rid of it means that SoftBank doesn't see it as a particularly lucrative part uh, of its strategy right now. I don't think ARM is suffering or anything, but you know that that can happen. Where if you don't get sold, then you start yeah. to have problems because you don't have the resources. 
Well, let's talk about watches, shall we? Smart okay. watches, in fact. Insider has seen documents and talked to sources who say that Google plans to launch a smartwatch next year. You might have a smartwatch, you might not, but Google wants to get in the game. Codenamed Rohan, the watch is in testing with Google employees, has a round face with no physical bezel and health and fitness sensors. It's unknown what, where, what the watch is going to be eventually called, but it's unlikely to be branded as a Fitbit as it's expected to cost more and compete a little bit more directly with the Apple Watch. So the Fitbit version of Google's business Kind of a different category, supposedly, than this new watch. In addition to the watch, Google is reportedly working on Project Nightlight, which would integrate Fitbit OS features into Wear OS at launch of this new watch. This also follows emerging Samsung's uh, Tizen into Wear OS 3. Google announced its first wearable OS back in 2014. The company's been at this for some time, but it hasn't made its own smartwatch until possibly soon it's it's yeah, I, uh, I love this idea pretty it, idea isn't it yeah well, yeah as much as i try to claim that i think the apple watch is pretty i really think round watches are prettier than square watches um but i keep thinking about that when google first started making the pixel it was kind of like okay this is a reference design it's boring it's like okay whatever but you know the sexy stuff will be made by other people but now the the google pixels are the sexy phones right so Maybe Google has got its game on in design and, and can really uh, bring a, a smartwatch that's pretty to the Android uh, ecosystem. I also, I I feel like, you know, I, I wear a Fitbit watch. Um, I, I've never had an Apple watch, but I feel like, unless you're really paying attention, you know, you kind of glance at somebody's wrist and you go, oh, yeah, they have that smart watch of some kind. But they all mostly look the same unless you're really showing somebody some great thing that your watch can do perhaps that theirs can't the idea that there are <laughs> more form factors you know that that people will love especially if they just never got on the smartphone train before like you said Allison the idea of a round watch i mean that sounds like a small detail and to me i'm like that kind of seems weird to display information because you're better in a square sense but again, all depends on on the person who's who's wearing it. Lots of Do people have tried the round watch uh, for smartwatches. Uh, obviously, they've tried it for all kinds of watches, but but lots of people have tried to do the smartwatch round, and it just never seems to stick. And the fact that Apple, the like the people who focus like design first, then will fit function into it, haven't done it, makes me think that this is tricky. Maybe Google's cracked it though. Maybe that that's why we're we're seeing this uh, this leak here because they're they're so proud that they just can't help talking even off the record about it. Well, mm. the the other thing is all of the round watches that I've looked at are are like the size of a dinner plate. They're huge. They're bulky. They're thick. They're giant. So if they can make one that's sleek and round, mm -hmm. that's asking a lot. And I suppose. presents and information properly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, I think and the we information might have to give up on that part. The information presenting thing is like that that's just what gets me every time. And I'm not saying we can't crack the code. Sure. But if 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 Allison sends me a text and it's sort of a paragraph and I'm reading that on the watch, <laughs> you don't want it to be around. Doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah, that's a good point. Allison and does I'm send looking me some paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, of course I do. The watch face I have is a round watch face, except then I've got complications tucked in the four corners to make sure I get as many on as possible. So, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, we'll find out. I, but yeah, I yeah. like the idea of Google getting into it. That's cool. And uh, they're, they're definitely proud to talk about it because The Verge was able to get direct source information as well after The Insider uh, came out. But 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 somebody's out there like, I, I can't go on the record, but let me tell you, oh my gosh, we're so excited about Project Rohan or whatever. Well, and the, the whole idea of uh, Google saying, okay, well, uh, we've acquired Fitbit and that is, uh, I mean, I'm a Fitbit user. I, there are many of us. and And that's great. And that is now, you know, our IP, but we want our new flagship smart watch to be something else entirely. It's very Google of them. Yeah. Well, they haven't had a flagship of their own. They've only, they've only made the operating but system. But like, if you think people. of it, like, like uh, compare it to like the pixel line, mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's some similarities there. Yeah. It, uh, that's a, what I think is interesting is that they're finally going to do that for the watch. They finally feel confident. They almost did it 
And then they were like, nah, this isn't very good. We'll just let LG sell this on their own. We're not going to put our name on it. So they must be really proud uh, this time. Yes, uh, round watch users, I see you in the Twitch chat. Send us your thoughts to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Windows 11 has required you to navigate a series of screens and settings to change your default browser. Uh, it makes you change the default browser for .htm and then also change it for .html and then also change it for .shtml, and so on. Uh, there are some ways to trick it into being uh, done by clicking on a link and doing it in the right way, but it hasn't been as easy as it should, but that won't last for long. Windows 11 Insider Preview Build 22509 still lets you assign by extension type if you want. You're not losing that, but it adds a make this browser, Chrome, Firefox, etc., your default browser as an option with a simple set default button. Developer Rafael Rivera uh, discovered the change earlier this week and Microsoft has confirmed, yes, that's in our test builds of Windows 11. Uh, we intend to make that change and let users set a default browser with a single button. It's not clear when this would get pushed out into Windows 11 proper to become available to all users, but it looks like you will get a very simple thing back. So I'm not sure why you thought it was better to do it the other way, Microsoft, but well done in changing it back. Now, to be clear, if you're running Edge and you try to download Chrome, it will still tell you, don't leave, don't leave, please, right? One thing at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they've yeah. changed that yeah. yet. So that was the verbiage, like, don't you want to be cool? Stay with Edge. Oh, yeah. No, there were multiples. And they're still there. Yeah. Uh, that that was that was earlier this week, you know, so let's, let's focus on the positive for the moment. It, but it, yes. These, these other ways of doing it, it just seems so reminiscent of the 1990s, doesn't no it? No kidding, right? Well, I, I get the giving you the option of like, hey, uh, your default browser is Chrome, but maybe you want PDFs to open in Firefox for some reason. Uh, here, we'll give you that control. That's great. Love that. Yeah. But don't take away that default button. That just, that was silly. Uh, maybe the nerds did it. I kind of think maybe that's what actually happened in this case. Right. Yeah. They're like, oh, we'll just give you all the controls. We don't need a default button then, right? Mm, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. We still did. Turns out. And and they're react they're responding to that. So good for them. Hey, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? You got a, a link? We we've been getting great links in our subreddit. Uh open bios in there giving good stuff. KV's giving good stuff. We appreciate everybody doing that. Uh get into the subreddit, submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. <laughs> Well, known Tesla enthusiast Allison Sheridan uh, worked very hard to get into the beta for Tesla's full self-driving software and has thoughts. You can read them at podfeet.com, uh, but we wanted to have her on to give us some of the top-line thoughts right here. Uh, there are only about 12,000 beta testers out there, so let's start with what you had to do to qualify, Allison. There was an algorithm that you had to make happy. Is that right? Yeah, in order to try to get into the beta, you have to turn on this thing they call safety score. And for, I think it was 30 days, they a 30 day rolling period, they, the car actually judges how well you're driving. And the people who got 100 out of 100 during the first period, they got the beta test first. And then they went to the 99s, they're starting to roll it out to the 98s right now. Um, I got to, to 99, and but the, the, the safety score is really interesting. You can speed as fast as you can, and you won't lose any points. You can you can cut off pedestrians. You can do all kinds of awful things and <laughs> still get a 99. But what you can't do is if it gives you a collision avoidance warning, your score just goes in the pooper right away. And it can be real, or it can just be doing it because it's wrong. Um, you can, It got mad at me for hard braking because I stopped for a yellow light. I could very safely stop for the yellow light. And if you mm -hmm. can, you're supposed to. But if I had sped through the light, which I'm not supposed to by California driver law, then I wouldn't have gotten dinged on my score. So I, I feel like it, like like the, the the algorithm is like your your grandpa, like, well, you shouldn't have been driving that fast in the first place. You should have slowed down <laughs> earlier. Like, yeah. So it, it sounds like they were like, of course, speeding is not part of the full self-driving software because the full self-driving software limits your speed, right? So right, they were right. only they were only testing you on the things you would have to do to take over. That's what it sounds like to me. Isn't yeah. though, Allison? Isn't wouldn't collision warning uh, scores also factor in uh, how uh, the car is driving around pedestrians? Yes, but it. 
I've never seen it give a collision award avoidance warning when I was near a pedestrian. It, it's more often than not, it's phantom. Uh, Steve got one. We were on the freeway. We were going, I don't know, 65 miles an hour, and there wasn't a car within 20 car lengths of us, and he got a collision avoidance warning. So that, unfortunately, is a fairly unreliable measure, and it's the most damaging to your score. But okay, but you, you were you were able to figure out the system. You got the 99. You got into the beta. Yes. Uh, and you you took it out for a spin. Uh, how's it work? What what are the settings? What tell us all about it? So the the thing that amazed me about it is how unready it is. Uh, I described it in my blog post as being a, a student driver who is also drunk. It's it's tentative at a lot of times, like it goes too slow or it's real jerky, like like somebody who hasn't learned how to make a smooth left turn. It kind of goes, you know, uh, or the light turns green and it takes a really long time to start up or it pulls into a left turn pocket and then slows way down, which is basically a way to get killed in Los Angeles. Right. If you mm -hmm. slow down as you get into a left turn pocket and you don't go and make the light, um, it makes a lot of mistakes, a lot, lot more than I expected. And I was thinking about this, Sarah, if, if you had a self-driving car, what would you like to feel like emotionally when it's driving? Very chill. Chill, relaxed, right? Yeah. My yeah. heart is pounding when it's driving. My palms are sweaty because, and I'm glad they only give it to people with good safety scores because there's no way I would take my eyes off of the road. I, I, I take it out of full self-driving when I want to relax because it's... I'm I'm just really surprised that it's as bad as it is. It was it was really shocking to me. Even though and, it's called full self driving, it's supposed to be a driver assist. It's not not supposed to be autonomous, right? But even driver assist should make you feel like it's making your driving better. And you're saying the beta isn't there yet. Still got some kinks to work out. I don't know if I would call it driver assist because when it's driving, it's driving. If you mm -hmm. grab the wheel and take control, it stops driving. So it's not like it's just assisting me. It's mm -hmm. either it's driving or I'm driving. So it feels more like it really thinks it is do it's supposed to be doing the driving. Now, as as bad as this is, one thing I did want to say, I had it on full self-driving and I was I came up to a T intersection. Uh, there was a, a car came from my left uh, and there were two lanes in my direction. So there was a car pulled pulled up on my right. This car comes from the left. My car let it go through. But then my car didn't go because a pedestrian was starting to walk into the crosswalk. But the guy to the right of me blew through the stop sign. He did not slow down. A human drove significantly worse than this self-driving car. And so what I what I just have to keep reminding myself is this car is going to get smarter. Humans are not getting smarter. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Unless, unless you're like, you need to be a better driver and think about this every day. Humans are going to do what they do. Your car did the right thing in that moment. Yeah. But also that's confusing data for your car. A good point. Good point. Luckily, the smartest person was the pedestrian who was playing complete attention and did not step out in front of the, the car that blew through the stoplight. So or stop sign. I was I was very I was scared because I saw that guy coming. I could tell he wasn't going to stop. Um, is, I just got 10.5. The first version was 10.4 and it was supposed to be better. It's a little better at accelerating from a stop. It, it tends to accelerate from a stop too slowly and it comes to a stop too quickly. It does really like it, it's accelerating right up to the light. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is the, uh, the model that I have, uh, has, uh, radar and optical sensors. And if you go into the full self-driving, it's only using the optical sensors and the newer models only have optical sensors. And both, both Steve and I feel like it's dumber because of that it's not, mm. it, it's like, it's not seeing things that we think it saw before, especially things that are farther away. Well, in the end, this is a beta, and it's mm -hmm. and it's using a, a, a new way of, of using sensors, going camera only and instead of radar, like you said. So are you still a believer in full self-driving? I, I hope so. Um, one of the things I look for in a beta program, I love to beta test software. It's a little more terrifying than beta testing like text expander or something. Uh, <laughs> but, but what I look for is a good mm -hmm. feedback mechanism. And the funny thing is the way you're supposed to do feedback is you're supposed to press a button on the screen that take, sends a video to Tesla. So here I am driving with, with a drunk student driver at the wheel, and I'm supposed to take my eye off the road, reach over quite a distance and find this, you know, two centimeter pixel, uh, you know, the icon on the screen to press it. 
Um, I have done it on occasion when I can safely look away for a nanosecond, uh, but I also use the, there's a scroll wheel on the, uh, on the steering column that you can click and you can say bug report. And if you speak really quickly, you can tell it what just went wrong. And I do that more often because I can safely do it while I'm still driving or while my, my drunk student driver is driving. But yes, I'm a believer, but we are so not there yet. Well, uh, where we are is emoji land, everyone. Um, <laughs> if, if you consider yourself Gen Z or under, you might have some potentially bad news here, depending on how you use emojis. The Unicord Consortium has, has issued its list of the top 10 most used emojis of 2021. They do this every year. Tears of joy is still the number one emoji. Now, I apologize on behalf of all older generations because we love to laugh and we also love to cry while we're laughing. Apparently, the uh, the Gen Z folks don't use this emoji as much. Of the 3,600 emojis, the top 100 account for 82% of those used. So most emojis aren't really getting used very much anyway. We don't have a lot of emoji range out there, but besides tears of joy and the ubiquitous heart emoji, I use it every day, all the time. Here's what continues to trend. Thumbs up sign, loudly crying face, folded hands, also known as the prayer emoji, face blowing a kiss, smiling face with three hearts, smiling face with heart-shaped eyes, smiling face with smiling eyes. So smiling faces, hand-based emotion power, uh, flower emojis, still the most popular, country flags, the least used. Mm. Mm. So no skull for smiling, no cowboy hat for feeling awkward. Oh, I, I got like, a friend just... who sends me a skull for everything. Yeah. He, it's his way of saying, that was funny, Sarah. I'm dying. Yeah. Skull. That's very Gen Z. <laughs> he, is kind of, he, is, he, he is a Gen Z person. Uh, oh, yeah. gosh, it's different. It's just different, depending on how you use it. What's interesting, I, too, is that uh, they said they, these haven't changed in the past couple of years, so... It's pretty, pretty mm. consistent in the mainstream anyway. I think a lot of it also has to do with, at least for me, it's like when I want to send somebody a reaction, it's like, what was my recently used? And then well, that's what I, was I thinking. just do that again. Yeah, maybe they're all in the recently used. And so yeah. this is so fulfilling and it'll never change because we don't yeah. know this. I didn't even know there was a skull there. Yeah, that makes perfect use sense. It a bunch. <laughs> all right, let's check out the mailbag. In the mailbag, John from Quiet Chili, Massachusetts, had an idea about who might be interested in the new Qualcomm gaming system on a chip. John writes, there are a number of ARM-based handheld retro emulation consoles released yearly by companies like Ann Bernick, OK Droid, o o o Droid, and Pow Kitty that run Linux or Android. While not a huge leap market, they have a large enough following worldwide that they keep making these consoles. Do the costs associated with Qualcomm system on chips most run on MediaTek or rocket chip SOCs and processors? This has led to st this has led to some stagnation in the market, not helped by the sem semiconductor shortage and compilations with shipping complications. Rather, I suspect, says John, that these companies are going to be using this new gaming-focused SOC in their handhelds within the next year. No, that's a great point, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for pointing those out. There, there are a bunch of. We talked about the nicheness of this yesterday. There are a bunch of uh, niche models out there that are now going to probably switch to Qualcomm, which is actually bad for Rockchip and and MediaTek. Uh, but that that's good info. Thanks for that, and, and thanks for sending along the links as well. It Indeed. Yeah. Links are in our show notes. And if you do have feedback, anything that we've talked about on the show, you got something to contribute, we want to hear from you. It makes our show better. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you in advance. We would also like to thank our brand new boss. And that brand new boss is Mr. Brains. <laughs> Mr. Brains just started back at us on Patreon. Thank you. Good, sir. See, you got brains. You back us on Patreon. Yeah. Right there in the name. Good stuff. <laughs> Also, thanks to Len Peralta, who has been illustrating the show. Good to have you back, Len. Let's talk illustrations. What did you draw for us today? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> I use the shrug emoji a lot, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I can see why uh, crying tear emoji would be big. I actually think that the crying tear emoji might be the one 
who was behind the self-driving car here, who is uh, uh, is uh, is obviously in this drawing chasing after uh, Podfeet, after Allison. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's one thing that I didn't hear, Allison, you, that you didn't, uh, it, it didn't chase you down. So uh, I, uh, you, you stayed in the car at least. Uh, but this is my depiction of if the if the uh, crazy emoji were were chasing tears of you joy down. at chasing Allison in an autonomous <laughs> it's, car. It's a little well, bit to be cruel, fair, isn't it, it? It does have the summon mode, so we could we could enact that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, this drawing, if you're into emojis and to self driving cars, uh, cars, this is uh, on my online store. Uh, at lenperaltastore.com. It's also at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash len. I also should mention I'm still drawing uh, custom-drawn holiday cards. I'm taking those orders until the 20th. So uh, you may want to get those in because my bandwidth is getting very thin on those. So good luck, everybody. Well, thank you, Len. Uh, good stuff as always. And also thanks to Allison Sheridan and uh, <laughs> helping us understand a little bit more about how it is to drive with an autonomous Tesla, among other things. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, I'm glad you asked about that, Sarah, because I've been hearing a lot about Meta and the Metaverse, and I wanted to understand what it actually was. So I asked a gentleman named Tom Merritt to come on Chit Chat Across the Pond Light with me and try to convince me that this is actually real. Uh, you can find that in your podcatcher of choice under Chit Chat Across the Pond Light or at podfeet.com. Well, that's excellent. Uh, it's it's always it's it's good. You know, we're we're uh, I don't know. I, I was trying. Was I time. was trying to make a supply chain joke about how we share resources and it wasn't coming <laughs> together. But we are live on the show Monday through Friday at four thirty p.m. Eastern, twenty one thirty UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Do join us live if you can. We'll be back on Monday to talk with Brian Brushwood about the work around the problems brought about by supply chain delays. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer, Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S. One. BioCow, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. And contributors for this week's show were Rob Dunwood, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Allison Sheridan. Thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. I'm the club. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>